Verse 1, God of heaven's armies, you find so much beauty in your people. They're like lovely sanctuaries of your presence. Deep within me are those lovesick longings, desires, and daydreams of living in union with you. Isn't that good? I got one amen on the second row over here, I think. I think that's where it was. I'm not sure. Deep within me, the psalmist says, are these lovesick longings, desires, and daydreams of living in union with you. He's talking about the presence of the Lord. And he says, when I'm near you, my heart and my soul will sing and worship with my joyful songs of you, my true source and spring of life. Can you say amen? Before I read the next couple of verses, there's something so profound about realizing that worship postures us again into this utter dependence of communion and yieldedness to being in the presence of God, to being before his face. The word face in the Hebrew is the same word for presence. This is why the presence of the Lord, when we worship together, we experience God through the word through worship, through fellowship, we experience the presence of God. We're actually experiencing his face. God manifests himself, his love, his attitude, his heart, his desires to us as we worship together. And the psalmist is writing about the the glory of, of that and how there's this utter dependence. Like he is the source of life. It's this picture of us waiting like Adam and Eve before all the bad stuff went down and they turned away from communion with God. We always look at it as like this legal sin that they committed. Of course, there's an action of disobedience, of eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But there's also this uh, broken fellowship that's at the core of the narrative of Genesis. And the, the psalmist in this attitude of worship to the presence is like, It's like this longing. You remember the Bible says that God came right after they turned away. God came and it says they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. In the ruah, in the wind of the day. Like they heard the sound. It was like this sweet longing of God's heart coming to meet with Adam and Eve in the garden. That was our original design is to be in communion and union. You were made for intimacy with him. You were, we were made in his image and likeness in, so we could be intimate with God, like the creator of all things. We're made. There's no, there's no other thing in creation that is made like you and I, not even the angels. You and I, as human beings, are made in the image of God to fellowship with him. And there's this deep longing, and I love what the psalmist says there at the end of what we just read. He says that when we worship, he says there's this, this awareness that he is the true source and spring of life. Worship postures our heart not only to experience God's presence, but and not only to be addicted to God's presence, which is the best addiction you can have. Come on, somebody. And there's a lot of addictions out there. I think every single unhealthy addiction is a counterfeit for the one thing which should be an addiction to the presence of the Lord. David said, my cup overfloweth. What did he mean by that in Psalm 23? I'm constantly intoxicated by your wine. Like, I don't have to go anywhere else. There's no love like the love that you give me. And that's what we find in the presence of the Lord. Oh, man, that's so good. And it postures our heart, worship postures our heart, not only to experience more of God, which is important, and we drink of the same spirit. This is what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12. We might jump to in a minute. And it says we drink of one spirit. We're one body, individual members. Isn't that beautiful? Like we are, we're one. We're one. God says we're one. Amen. Don't, don't, like we have to be careful. We have to say what the Lord is saying. Jesus prayed the church would be one. I don't believe the church is divided. I believe the church doesn't really act right sometimes. And I'm, we're talking about ourselves, right? Sometimes we, but we're one. God looks at us and says, you're one body. We're one body. Even if a body has parts that are doing different things and and not behaving as one harmonious body, it's still one body. 
It's just a sick body. So there might be some things the body of Christ needs some healing in, but we're still one body. Two plus billion people all over the globe. Come on, think about the church in underground China, like the underground church in China. We're talking tens of thousands born again a day. It's surpassing the birth rate. The charismatic church is the second largest subgroup of the body of Christ, the two plus billion people on the planet. And the charismatic church is the fastest growing church in the world. Tens of thousands a day down in South America, tens of thousands a day born again. Like that's your, that's our family. And we're one body all over the world, born again, experience, and, and, and we're one body. So it postures our heart to not only experience God, but also to be aware, hear me, that we should be utterly dependent upon the presence of the Lord. Yes, yes. Oh man, the church needs this. The body of Christ needs this yes. because we have made The Sunday gathering, which I love, we should have a zeal and an honor for the Sunday gathering. It's not just about it. Like they met in the temple in Acts and they also met in the home. You know, there's small group and there's also a large group. There's nothing wrong with large group. I think churches that ridicule mega churches are just jealous their church isn't that big. When I stopped talking bad about mega churches, our church in Vegas went from 200 to 500. Did you hear what I just said? Well, the seeker-friendly movement, blah, blah, blah. That big church down the road, blah, blah, blah. When I stopped doing that and I started honoring and posturing my heart, you know what? There's living water there. They're not doing it the way I would do it, but they're still doing it to the best of their ability. They're, they're reaching people. They're reaching people. Now, I'm not talking about a cult or something. I'm talking about Christians, you know, believers in Jesus. They preach the gospel to the best of their ability. When I, when I honored what the Lord was doing in the larger body of Christ... I received a blessing. How many know that sometimes dishonor blocks a blessing? Come on, somebody. And that, that includes in relationship. Like if I'm not seeing who you honor is being able to value and see what heaven has marked other people with. Like look around the room. What has heaven marked the people around you with? Honor it. Receive it. It's beautiful. It's a display of the very glory of God, the kabod, the the glory, the weighty glory, the riches, honor, majesty of heaven. God marks us. He smears us with holy oil. It's the anointing, right? That all stems from the anointed one. And we're all just different expressions of that one body. But posturing our heart to worship is, I'm taking a long time on these two verses and I don't care. Praise God. It not only postures us to experience the Lord, but there's something about it that says, God, there's no other place I would rather be than right here in your presence. It's kind of like the feeling that you have when you are with company and you're in the presence of people that make you come alive. You all know what I'm talking about, right? Right. It could be a spouse. It could be a friend. It could be coming to church. It could be like there's something. And I'm not talking about, I'm talking about that really causes you to come into your true identity in Christ. Because there's a lot of things I think that we can get caught up in. And sometimes we think, oh, that makes me come alive. No, that's like there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end is the way of death. Hello? Like I I remember in, in Vegas, you know, there's a lot of clubs and stuff. A lot of people feel really alive in clubs, but how many know that that's not healthy? Right. Come on, somebody. What happens in Vegas, you know, stays in Vegas. We change that to what happens in Vegas won't stay in Vegas, but will shake the nations for the glory of God. <laughs> we saw Vegas marked with heaven. And if God could do it there in Sin City, and God could rename it Revival City, Grace City, Saint City, Sun City, then he can do revival. He, like, he can break out anywhere. Like Rochester is going to be known for a place of presence, a place where we don't get a lot of sunlight, but the heavens are open in the spirit. But there's something about a holy experience we have of God's presence, his face, his love. And it's, it's like this, you are the source of life. And I don't want to leave I just want to be right. It's like being in the presence of someone you love that makes you come alive. It's like being in the presence. It's like when my wife and I, we went on this uh, 20-year anniversary trip, and my wife says, 
I want to go to Mexico. So I'm like, okay, let's go to Mexico. So we went on our 15 year. And then we went to a different place in Mexico, Cabo San Lucas, which is the place where I was in a very deep sleep. The Lord caused me to go into a deep sleep, took my rib. No, I'm just kidding. Different story. Um, Adam and Eve. I was in a deep sleep and I had a dream about this church. And I didn't know it was this church at the time. I'm not going to get into that story, but we were on that trip and there was this moment where we go down to this restaurant and it's called Sunset Mona Lisa. It is supposed to be one of the most romantic places in the world. And, uh, and so we went, we show up and it was just like, it was literally a dream. We were, we were, it was unbelievable, it was so beautiful. And, and there's, we walk down and, and we, we get seated out on the patio that overlooks uh, the, the tip of the Baja in Cabo San Lucas. If you've never seen it, it's known for, you know, there's these arches and it's just gorgeous. And so we see that and it's right at the time of sunset. So the sun's going down and we go down and you can hear the waves crashing on the rocks. We, we're in the best seat of the house and they're treating us like royalty. And we sit down and we can't even look at the menu. We're just caught up. Then it starts to lightly rain. And then all of a sudden there's a rainbow. And I'm like, I'm tearing up. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like this couldn't be any more beautiful. And we were surrounded. The food was great. I mean, like the filet mignon melted like butter. Come on, somebody. It was like butter. It just, you just, I didn't even need a knife. I could have just like went like that. I wouldn't have done that in a fancy restaurant. Can you imagine eating filet with my fingers? Actually, I probably will next time just to be rebellious because that's who I am. No, I'm not. So we're just enjoying everything about this. But you know what the most beautiful thing was about this moment? Was being in my wife's presence, gazing into her face. See, there's moments in life where you want to freeze time. There's moments in life where beauty turns the heart. There's moments in life, and it could be, you know, the other day I'm uh, hanging out with my younger son, and I, I, have, I could tell you so many stories of the experience of God's love reciprocated in family. And, and reciprocated in church, like just brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not just married people. You might be unmarried and think, well, well I don't know what that is. Yes, you can know what that is because uh, the, the love in a marriage is only a, just a, a little expression of the love that Jesus has for his bride, which is you. Amen. Didn't hear a lot of amens from the guys, but you're the bride of Christ, guys. The hairy-legged bride of Christ. Come on, somebody. Unless you shave. That's a whole other story. Deliverance, no. So I'm hanging out with my son and there's these moments. There's these moments. Don't miss the moments. I'm hanging out with my younger son. And he doesn't even know this, but we're just sitting there talking. And he said one thing that just gripped my heart and the, and the Lord's like, pay attention. He just looks over at me and he says, I love you, Dad. And it was that reciprocated love that came back to me. And I, and I thought about like the Father's heart when we come to him in worship. It's just like, God, I don't just want the blessings. I just want to be in your presence. You're the source of life. You're, you're, every, you're the air that I breathe. I care everything, man. This is my cry and my heart. I just, I want to meet with God when we come in here on Sunday. I, I don't want to just hear a nice song and a nice sermon. I want to, I want to experience the presence of God. I want, to, I want to meet with God together. It's not just about me. Like I want God to touch every person in the room in a way where we're never the same. And then we realize like there's no other place that I'd rather be. And this is what the psalm is talking about. Those moments where it's like time stops. It's like there's no... I don't want to move on. Can we just, just freeze time right now? My heart is so bent. My heart is so melted in this love that God has for me. And this is what the psalmist says. Verse 9, he says, God, your wraparound presence is our defense. Your kindness, look, in your kindness, look upon the faces of your anointed ones. <laughs> You know, God looks at you, and he's smiling at you. Even when we do silly, dumb things, his gaze is a furious love. And it's that furious love that can turn our hearts to get right. 
and turn away from the things that, that maybe we would say, well, God's so disappointed. And we can grieve him and we can quench him. But I don't like the word disappointment because it's like to remove from position. Do you know that when God calls you his child, you remain his child? Hello? And that'll never change. You can never, listen, you can't do anything to change God's heart and mind about you. C.S. Lewis says the flames in hell are the same flames of the furious love of God. What does that mean? People that hold on to their sin and turn away and resist his love in the afterlife, it's torment. The people that turn to his love, it's warm, healing love. It's the presence of God. It's the love of God. You know, that's the ancient understanding of the afterlife of heaven and hell. I'm not here to preach about that, but I'm here to preach about the presence of God. And there's something about knowing that we have an Abba that wants to wrap his presence around us. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's so uh, fulfilling. Like, it, it, there's, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. And I, I see little expressions, little spotlights that point to this one thing, you know. In these moments with my bride, or these romantic moments, or these moments with my kids where it's like, man, I'm just caught up. And there's something that's so holy about recognizing how important it is for us to get caught up to encounter his presence together. All right, I've, I've read three verses. Let's keep going. Pray for me, guys. Verse 10. Better is one day in your courts. And the passion, it says, for just one day of intimacy with you is like a thousand days of joy rolled into one. Amen. Oh, man. I remember, like, I was, I was uh, raised Catholic and... I had moments in my life where Jesus was revealing himself to me. Are you thankful that God unveils? He, he reveals his love to us, right? His hand is upon us. He sends people across our path. Like, he uses people in our life. If you, if you just stop and think, you, you could remember all these moments. In God, and sometimes God will show you, like, you remember that one time this person said that? You know, and it's like, that was me telling you to just stop it, you know? <laughs> that was me turning your heart. And, and so I remember these times I encountered the Lord, but it wasn't until I, uh, I went to this church, this little church that loved broken people in uh, an inner city area of Las Vegas. And it was packed out and they were known for worship. And I remember one night they had this praise and worship celebration and they're singing songs. I don't know the songs. I was ashamed to sing. So I lip synced in worship and it worked. I still experienced God. It was like, you know, God still loved on me, even though I wasn't, you know, I'm like, I'm lifting my hands. I'm just, I wanted to blend in. So I'm like, this is weird. What are these people doing? Lift, why are they lifting their hands? And, uh, and it was like this surrender and this beautiful thing. And I remember getting caught up and experiencing the presence of God. I literally forgot where I was. I was caught up. I remember opening my eyes and like, where am I? And what just happened? I have never experienced anything like that. I resonate with what I just read. Better is one day in your presence than a thousand days elsewhere. Better is one day, one moment. There's something so important for us to remember. It's the plumb line of our existence. It is the, the fountain and the primary purpose of being the church together is to prioritize meeting with him, experiencing his presence together. Amen. Amen. One day of intimacy with you is like a thousand days of joy rolled into one. I'd rather stand at the threshold in front of the gate, beautiful, ready to go in and worship my God than to live my life without you in the most beautiful palaces of the wicked. I'd rather be a doorkeeper. <laughs> Well, Lord, bishop sounds really good. Can I be a bishop? Or pastor, you know, can I just get a place of authority? Can I get a position of recognition that's very significant? I remember this longing in my heart. I was searching for something. I, and I didn't know what I was searching. I didn't even know what I was missing. 
and I was looking for love in all the wrong places, and I was looking for significance in a title or a position in the church. And I remember like recognizing the anointing on my life early on. I got saved when I was 17 and I experienced the Lord, the story that I just told you. And then, and things are moving really fast. And, and I'm just like, man, God's called me into ministry. I just knew it. And, and I, I start leading worship. And, and when I play and sing on the guitar, like th- something happens, a, a wind from the unseen realm just, and I'm like, man, God's using me. And then I start, you know, teaching a little bit and, 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 and I'm like, God's called me to ministry. And, and, and I, I found myself like longing for people around me to recognize what I felt like God put in me, which is, which is an important thing. But I was looking for promotion and position and power for all the wrong reasons. For the sake of feeling significant. For the sake of feeling important or big or better or somebody. I want to be somebody, right? Isn't that like a deep cry? And I mean, there's greatness. And God wants all of us to walk in greatness. But what is the motivation of the heart? You know, when we read the Psalms, I think about David. And David was a man after God's own heart. You know, you read Psalm 51 when he, the whole story of Bathsheba in the springtime, he's supposed to be off at war, right? And then he sees Bathsheba, falls into sin with her. Uh, he didn't fall into sin. He pretty much dug a hole filled water and dumped in, jumped in head first, right? Like he, he just chose it and, and the whole story. And then, and then he tries to deceive her husband and get him drunk and throw him on the front lines of the battle. And, and then his sins exposed by the prophet. The prophet tells him a little story. There's a rich man, a poor man, the rich man, you know, has all these sheep and all everything that he wants. And the poor man has one little lamb and this little lamb, this little girl lamb is like a member of their household. The, the lamb eats at dinner with them. Does that remind you of some people's dogs and their relationship with them? You know, pictures of them kissing their dog. If you do that, it's okay. God have mercy on your soul. But it's nasty, bro. I'm, just take some anti-worm thing after you do that or something. I don't know. So Nathan the prophet is, is about to expose David, the, the, the man of God. And, and he says, this poor man just has this one little lamb. And then a visitor comes to town and the rich man's like, I'm not going to use the million, I'm exaggerating, but all these wonderful livestock that I have to, to feed this visitor. I'm going to take this one little lamb that the poor man has and I'm going to kill it and we're going to eat that little lamb. And David's like, what in the world? Who is this person? We got to just, no, man, let's, let's punish this person for this. And, and Nathan's like, you are the man. That's the wrong kind of you're the man you want to hear, right? You're the man. (laughs) Not that kind of man. It's like, no, you're the one. You're the rich man in the story. And then he turns his heart quickly. He's, He's like, I've sinned before the Lord. He didn't even care what people thought. He's like, I just want to be right with God. I don't care. See, Saul was all about how do I look in the eyes of the people? David was like, what does God see when he looks at my heart? A lover, I'd rather be a doorkeeper. I don't need significant, I don't need a platform. I don't need a microphone. I don't need to be the one. I don't need to be the guy. I don't need to have a solo. I don't need a spotlight. Come on, somebody. I just want to be in the same room. When God's moving, I could be a fly on the wall. I am delighted to stand here on the front row and be in the presence of God and worship with God's people. I'd rather be a doorkeeper. David is repenting in Psalm 51, and he says, take not thy spirit from me. How many know in the new covenant, the Holy Spirit doesn't leave us? But let's look at the context of David saying, no matter what, Lord, I want to be able to experience your wraparound presence. And he's turning. He's like, cleanse me. Like, wash me clean. We're just singing about the blood of Jesus. Are you thankful for restoration? And how many know the story of David? Like, he was still a man after God's own heart. He was still God's man. He was still God's man. After everything that happened to him, man, wow, that's so powerful. And you read the heart after God, it says a couple different times in the Bible, David was a man after God's own heart. 
A man after, a man that pursued, a man whose heart was fashioned like God's heart, and a man who pursued God, a man who loved the presence of God. Better is one day with you than a thousand. Better is one day of intimacy with you than a thousand days of joy rolled into one. Lord, I want to journey into the deep waters of never being satisfied but continually being satisfied by these rivers of living water of your presence. Godliness with contentment is great. And there's a dissatisfied satisfaction in me. Like I'm so content in your presence, but I'll always want more. And I'll always come back to this fountain because you are the source of life. You know what? The church, the body of Christ falls into these snares of celebrity Christianity, of, you know, things that, that, that make, cause the church to die, like the lack of true discipleship and, and the lack of miracles and the lack of uh, signs and wonders and all that. You know why? All of these things can be rooted in uh, churches that don't prioritize meeting with God and prioritizing the presence of God. Because when we prioritize His presence... Something happens in us. It's, it's the plumb line of our existence, but we, we know that we are, hear me, significant apart from all the other stuff. Yes. Yes. You know what I love when I watch Christian and Sarah lead worship? You guys might not realize, but you, like Christian, sometimes he'll, he's way over here. The camera guy loves me right now. I think it's my son, Josiah. I'm in the dark, right? Christian's way over here leading worship. I love it. And Sarah, <laughs> I took a picture, is way over here. She's way over here. I don't know what you're doing on the camera when they're doing it, but you know what I love about that? You don't really, it's a prophetic picture of your like, Lord, take the platform. Because when God manifests in his presence and power, it ain't about somebody singing or preaching. It's about him. And our hearts are undone. And we, we are starving without it. This is what Holy Communion is really supposed to be about. I'm starving without your presence. I come to your table for the bread of life, the bread of your presence. Better's one day. Say, better's one day. Early on in ministry, the Lord fashioned my heart. I was longing for significance. I was searching for it. I was searching for somebody to come along and just say, Zach, you're called into ministry. You know, a prophet's prophesying. I never got a prophetic word. I'm like, am I ever, is anyone ever going to affirm? Is anyone ever going to see what I feel like God is saying and seeing about me? This is how I felt. I felt invisible. And had God used someone to promote me, it would have been devastating because the Lord was fashioning my heart to be addicted to his presence more than popularity. Amen. The Lord was fashioning my heart to love sheep before him giving me a kingdom. Which, by the way, like David never asked to be king. He didn't say, take not thy kingdom from me. He said, take not thy spirit from me. Do we love his presence more than anything else? Do we love his spirit even more than our own spirit? Our own breath, our own words, our own fumes, our own ideas. Lord, I want the true source of my existence and everything that flows from it all to be from the fountain of your presence. I love your presence, Lord. I'd rather be in your presence than anywhere else. Yes. I'd rather be a doorkeeper, in fact. I'd rather not have a title, an official spiritual title. I don't need to be some amazing leader of a revival or a movement. I just want to be a lover of presence. And in the humble hunger of my heart that something Something above everything else finds, I find my source of significance just as being loved in his presence, his wraparound presence. Psalm 27, here's the one thing I crave from Yahweh, the one thing I seek above all else. I want to live with him every moment in his house 
beholding the marvelous beauty of Yahweh, filled with awe, delighting in his glory and grace, I want to contemplate in his temple. Psalm 51, don't cast me away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Remember, Holy Spirit doesn't leave you, but there's the, the, what we can learn from this is there's this cry of his heart, like God, he didn't say take thy kingdom. Don't take the kingdom, Lord. He's like, take not thy spirit from me. When we pray, our Father, hallowed be your name. Remember, we pray, your kingdom come. If we don't allow the Lord to heal this lie of insignificance in our hearts where we search for it in everything else, our career, our job, our relationships, social media, hello, spouses, not having spouses, we're looking for significance in all the wrong places. But when we find our significance in his presence, in his heart, we don't get caught up in all this other stuff. And we just know we're loved. And in the acceptance of him, we are healed from the rejection of many. And then we're not afraid to be rejected to where we put on this facade because I want you to accept me. So I'm not going to show you the real me because I'm so afraid of being rejected. I'm just going to be different. But how many know that if we're not truly us, if we don't really come into the light of his presence where everything is open, our hearts are open, we can't truly be loved if we're not truly ourselves. Isn't that right? Amen. But when we're truly ourselves, we can be truly loved. So we actually run from the thing we need the most, which is true intimacy, fellowship. Right? right? Amen. We can't have fellowship with one another if we're not walking in the light. First John chapter 1. Wow. And there's a connection between the cleansing of the blood and the fellowship we have with one another. There's this intimacy, the Holy Spirit. See, in the presence of God, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says that we've all been made to drink of one spirit. And we're no longer Jews, Greeks. No, the labels have come off. The walls have come down. We are one. We are baptized in the spirit. When we're baptized in the presence of God, we're made one. Our hearts are knit together in love. But we're not afraid. We're not afraid to, like, I'm going to be rejected. So I'm just going to, I'm not going to really tr truly show you who I am because I just want to be accepted. But if I don't show you who I am, I can't truly be loved. So I'd rather be rejected for who I am than accepted for who I'm not. Amen. And in the presence of the Lord, all this stuff falls off. Amen. It just melts off in the holy fire of his love. You don't take anything with you, man. You, when he takes a platform, it's all about his love and his presence. Come on, somebody. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 12, that the significance of the body of Christ is that every part is significant. You're significant. You don't need a title. You're a son, a daughter. And in closing, I, I, I'll just share with you briefly in my experience as a leader, a pastor, I plant a church and I had met somebody a few years before we planted the church that came into my life and changed my life. And uh, he was a father. And I, I have a, an amazing father who has always displayed such a, a, an amazing uh, heart of affirmation and um, encouragement and but I didn't have a spiritual father. I didn't have somebody in my life that like actually saw who I was and called out destiny. But there was an opportune time for this affirmation. Had it happened before, it probably wouldn't have turned out okay, to be honest with you. And I remember we planted the church. Things are going really good. And, um, and, and so I meet this man named Larry Titus. And Larry just called out the gold and the destiny and affirmed me and loved me. And I, I remember, I'll just tell you one of the stories, like he invited me to this thing where he pours into pastors from all over the world. Uh, it, it's called the elder gathering. And he invites like 20 plus people. Um, and he pours into these pastors and leaders. And, and a lot of these pastors are like 
way above my pay grade. Like they're just, they're mega church pastors and they're humble and kind and anointed. And, but they're from all over, like Europe, Africa, you know, Nigeria, uh, California, like all over Brazil. And Larry calls me and Larry Titus, who ha- himself has pastored multiple mega churches all over the country, Pennsylvania, um, a Beth- the Beth- Bethesda church in Wenatchee, Washington, which is a part of the Jesus people movement, a powerful influence of, of that revival. And uh, all over, you know, he, in Amarillo, Texas, he appointed uh, Jimmy Evans. I don't, I don't know if you know who Jimmy Evans is, Marriage on the Rock. Larry put him in the pastorate in Amarillo, Texas at Trinity Church. So Larry Titus comes into my life and he's like, Zach, you're so anointed. You're so anointed, you can't even help it. I'm like, no one's ever said that to me. What do you mean? He's like, I love you to pieces. You just say these things. I'm like, why do you love me to pieces? What do you see in me? No one else sees it. How do you see it? Well, the heart of the father in him reached out and it was God's wraparound presence through him that healed the lie of insignificance in my heart. He would say things like, I'm behind you 100%. Whatever you need, I'm here. Then he invited me to this gathering. And I'm like, he says this, he says, I'm inviting you to this gathering. He's like, if you don't have a money for a hotel, just get the plane ticket, I'll put you up. Who does that? A great man of God like this, we like, uh, by the way, you know, do you want to become a partner in my ministry and so a thousand dollars? Like, you know, this is the culture I was used to. This guy didn't want anything from me. The only motivation was he just wanted to love me and pour into me and disciple me. So he invites me, he says, bring your guitar. You're so anointed for worship. And I'm like, okay, I'll bring my guitar. I would be honored. And I thought he was asking me to lead worship for this gathering. And I'm like, I would, I've always been the David, man. I, I, I led worship for Randall Cunningham. Like I'll, I'll lead worship. You know, that, that was who I was. I was just bring the presence, right? Like that's, I'm serving the house. I'm the doorkeeper serving the house of the Lord. And he says, yeah, I want you to lead worship. But Zach, you're one of the pastors I'm inviting to pour into. I thought I was just a worship leader. He says, no, you're one of the guys I want to pour into. And I couldn't talk. My eyes welled up with tears. And I'm like, for the first time in my spiritual journey, somebody loved me for who I was. Somebody affirmed me. And I knew my significance apart from a gift. I knew my significance apart from a title. I'd been pastoring for a couple of years and the church was succeeding but I still battled with the lie of insignificance I want to tell you this morning in the presence of the Lord you find your significance you don't need a title you're so significant you're so significant to him you're so loved and there's riches in you that wants to come forth and it will only come forth if you have a heart like David that says I'd rather be in your presence than anywhere else I'd rather be a doorkeeper. I don't need a title. Are you hearing me this morning? I don't need to be significant based upon a position or power. We don't need to jockey for position. That is anti the culture of heaven and the culture of honor. I just want to experience your love and presence and let it overflow. I don't have to be the one because he's the one.